Good evening and welcome to the last event for our film series brought to us by the American Resilience Project. Over the last two evenings, we watched The Burden and Tidewater, two fascinating documentaries about the impact of fossil fuels and climate change on our nation's military. Tonight, we will screen Current Revolution, which is slightly different in that it addresses the seismic shifts in the energy system. If you haven't had the chance to watch the two other films, you still have access through the app, and we hope you will make the time to view them. I am Margaret Jackson, the Deputy Director for Climate and Advanced Energy for the Global Energy Center. And I'm also a former surface warfare officer and military spouse. I would like to thank you on behalf of the Atlantic Council for joining us for Veterans Advanced Energy Week. I'm excited to share that we have the award-winning director, Roger Sorkin, here with us for our last evening together to discuss the making of Current Revolution. We will talk for about 10 minutes before starting the film screening. Roger, thanks for being here with us this week and for taking the time again this evening. In your last two films we enjoyed this week, your focus was on the military. And as you described in our previous conversations, you used the stories of the military dealing with energy and climate challenges because the military is a trusted messenger, as you said. And as the trusted messenger, the military can ring the alarm bells for climate change and demonstrate the urgency to accelerate the energy transition. Tonight, as we shift to a, a somewhat related subject, um, we have a wider variety of messengers. Can you tell us who you feature in this film and why you thought they were important to the narrative? Yes, thank you, Maggie. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure and honor to be back with you. Um, this film, uh, there, you know, I, I start every film when people ask me, what is the film about? I tend to, uh, without even realizing it, I, I, I first start talking about the intention before I start talking about the story. And, you know, in this case, the intention is to overcome, and this is true really from, for all of the films that I work on, is overcome the political obstacles uh, and to depoliticize issues that I find, uh, that I'm sure we would all agree, should not be political. Um, climate change, energy resilience, public health, food security, those all fall under the banner of, of the types of films that we're working on. And in this particular case, I was curious about trying to unite a number of interests, um, particularly in the private sector, uh, thinking specifically about the utilities, automotive, tech, and defense sectors. Um, thinking that, well, what is it that unites them all? Well, they all need a reliable electric grid to do their work. Uh, as we do all need a reliable electric grid. And so, you know, I, I try to come, come at this story with um, what I call a strategic narrative. Um, you know, for those of you who heard me last night, uh, strategic narrative is, you know, basically just a story that everyone can relate to in their daily lives and that can unite people around a common purpose. Um, at least that's, that's the interpretation that I, I've taken after. The term is it's not my original term, but it's, it's one that I, uh, I learned of through some, some military strategists who used the term in a paper that they wrote several years ago. Uh, you know, in this case, the, the, what we can all relate to in our daily lives is the need for a reliable electric grid. Understanding that we have problems with reliability in our electric grid and that we have environmental challenges that threaten its reliability. Um, I set out to create a film that, that had something in it for everyone, all of the aforementioned groups. Um, you know, the, if, we're, if we're going to really transform our electric system, uh, we need all those players involved. We need, you know, it is a, again, it's an all hands on deck situation where, you know, you can't just expect the utilities industry to build the charging infrastructure that we need for electric vehicles if the automotive industry is not making those vehicles on the scale that we need them. Um, so, you know, they really have to work together. And, you know, of course, it's a national security question every time. I mean, um, as you'll find out in the film, uh, former Assistant Secretary of the Army, Catherine Hammack, will make the case that a lot of the bases that we have are at the end of power, uh, at the end of the transmission line. So, as she says, if anything happens upstream, then the base is without power. So, you know, it's, it's very, actually, of all of the, the tough issues that we wrestle with as a country, um, understanding energy resilience is, is one of those things that uh, I think naturally exists outside the realm of, of uh, you know, po of politics. I mean, of course, you need politics to come up with solutions, and we're going to always disagree on, you know, what, what, to what degree are we going to either raise taxes or incentivize the private sector, you know, 
really, you know, looking at uh, that the, sort of the classic liberal position is let the government do it, classic conservative position is let the private sector do it. It's never that simple. You need them both. And uh, that's what I'm really trying to do with this film is to show that there's room for everybody at the table. Everybody needs to be at the table or nothing's going to get done. Um, so that's, that's really the, the goal behind this film. It's actually the first in a series of films uh, called Current Revolution, where what we're trying to do is create a roadmap, um, a narrative essentially that will guide other communities trying to make energy transitions. Uh, this first one that you're going to see uh, looks at the country more broadly. Uh, we filmed in Arizona and, New and uh, Ar Arizona and Georgia in particular, um, but it really tries to make the case that this is a nationwide effort. And, and we bring in the story of DOD coming to Georgia to try to build the energy resilience around some of the bases there. And the, the uh, army in particular has had really great success. Um, in fact, you have uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense under the current administration, well into the current administration, who appears in the film. Um, you know, he's not talking about climate change. I didn't ask him about climate change because I knew better. Um, but he's talking about energy resilience. He's talking about energy security, cyber war warfare, um, and trying to make our bases more energy resilient. So, you know, that's the common ground that we can come down to. Um, you know, that that's where we have to find uh, the, that cooperation. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll tell you very quickly just about some of the other uh, other episodes we're looking at the Navajo okay. Nation. I wanted to ask you about that. So please, yeah, tell us what's in store for you next, because now we have a, a taste of your work and I know we're enjoying it so much. So we'd love to follow your journey where you're sure. going next. Sure. So uh, another film that's coming out in the next couple of months is uh, looking at the Navajo Nation, which just closed its uh, coal uh, fire, coal fired power plant, the Navajo Generating Station. Um, it had been going for 40 years. It's a, definitely a mixed bag. Uh, it it, it pro provided some level of economic stability for the nation. Uh, at the same time, it did an awful lot of environmental damage, polluted the aquifer, drained the aquifer. Uh, and now, you know, we're trying to figure out this question of environmental justice. They, they closed the plant, but there's still a legacy that needs to be mitigated. Uh, and, uh, you know, what do we do with unemployment on the Navajo Nation. What do we do with COVID-19? Decimating, um, you know, I mean, it, it, it was the highest per capita outbreak for a while in the country uh, in uh, on the Navajo Nation. And that, that directly ties into a lack of a reliable electric grid. We've gotten uh, many homes, uh, I've seen statistics as high as 40% of homes on the Navajo Nation that lack access to running water and electricity. When you think about the requirements for good public health, hand washing, access to good communication, refrigeration, uh, you know, it all ties back to clean water and reliable electricity. And so, um, you know, what we're trying to do is, is, is use this as a model for other communities who are about to undertake this very complex process of transition. Um, it's daunting for smaller communities and, and municipalities or states. They don't know where to begin. Uh, there's a lot of competing interests. And so, uh, what we're trying to do is, is give them some inspiration and, and a sense of, of a realistic path forward. So we're looking at Navajo, we're looking at Hawaii, which has been leading. Uh, also, there's a very, very big uh, DOD uh, part of that story, you know, a lot of installations in Hawaii, uh, very important for our national security. And you've got a lot of favorable work being done uh, in the Energy Resilience Office, specifically in the Navy. Um, that is, uh, you know, and, and of course, you know, dealing with uh, of local populations that don't want a lot of wind turbines offshore and uh you know there's there's so many things to consider having it all come together in a coherent narrative gives people the clarity that they need to understand uh you know essentially see the constellation and of how all those dots connect right yes i mean your work touches on on so many things and we actually had a really popular uh wonderful environmental justice panel yesterday so it sounds like when this film comes out hopefully we can we can feature in, a, in our next year or something like that um but really your message of finding common ground is so important and i think your your message and your films have really been an inspiration for all of us uh in the audience as we're moving forward and thinking about where we want to contribute uh past our time in military service so Thank you again for your message. Um, it's been a great discussion over the last few nights. And again, we can't thank, thank you and, and the American Resilience Project for supporting us here uh, this week at Veterans Advanced Energy Week. 
Um, with that, I'm going to wrap up um, and I'm going to uh, ask our audience to just enjoy tonight's film, Current Revolution. And I will also put in a plug that tomorrow is our last day for Veterans Advanced Energy Week. So we look forward to seeing everyone again tomorrow. Thank you again, Roger, and everyone have a great night. Thank you, Maggie. Thanks to the Atlanta Council and everybody else. Okay, thank you. Everyone enjoy Current Revolution. First thing that I would have to say is the fact that I am a believer. I believe that God created this world and put that sun out there, in my opinion, for us to take advantage of. For those people in the fossil fuel industry, it is a simple truth that your business is going to go away. It's just a matter of figuring out how to do that without leaving people behind or destabilizing the system. Basically, every utility in this country still adheres to the old business model, which is let's go out there and build big power plants Meanwhile, all their customers want more and more solar energy efficiency and storage. So you have this clash of what customers want and the business model of the past of the utilities. To an average consumer, what they want, they want the light to come on when they flip the switch and they want to be able to pay the bill. You don't really have the appreciation of electricity until you don't have it. We've got to understand that we have a moral obligation. We've got to be very much concerned about who we put into power and decisions about our life. I can get out and march all day long, but unless we understand the political process and who we put in office to make the decision, then it's all for naught. The electric power system has been one of the most successful and reliable technological systems that we've developed in the modern age. Well, electricity is almost like air. People just assume it's always going to be there. The system that we've inherited was fine for the 1930s and 1940s. But it's not as resilient as it should be. It's not as smart as it should be. It's not serving people as effectively as it should be. There's vested interests in maintaining that old system, but there's a larger openness to thinking about how can we move to a new grid system that meets the needs of the 21st century. The original grid was designed to allow power to flow in one direction from the generator to the user. And now we've got the need for power to flow in both directions, and the utility feels threatened by that. The utility in this state does not want to advance the solar, other than if they own it. But they see solar as a out-and-out -out competitor. In six states across the country, power companies are fighting to change the rules. Presented thousands of signed cards from supporters, urging commissioners not to change net metering rates. Shouldn't I have the freedom to put solar panels up on my roof if I want? Isn't that, like, shouldn't that be my choice? Should there really be a utility telling me, no, you can't do that? If they keep trying to push that, more and more people are just going to disconnect from the grid. Disasters that we're seeing, like the hurricane devastation in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, and other islands, 
provide us an opportunity to um, completely rethink our energy infrastructure. Firefighters are first responders, so they need to have their communications up and running so that they can take emergency calls and take care of the community. And if their generators are going down and breaking and the grid is not on, you know, that poses a real danger to the community because they can't even call the help that they need. So we just put up a 6.6 .6 kilowatt system here, and it's also connected to some battery storage. So the wonderful thing about that is we are able to make sure this fire station has power 24 hours a day and demonstrate to the leaders in the area and to the community in general that this technology works. You know, that's really going to save lives at the end of the day. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission says there's nine points of failure in the United States. You take any one of those out, or if they fail, then you could have partial grid collapse. And many of our bases are at the end of the power line. And with the number of grid disruptions going on, if anything happens upstream, we run out of power and we're solely running on diesel generators. If we're able to get them up more rapidly through renewable energy, or if they don't consume as much energy, then we increase the resiliency of that base. So we're able to serve the communities in which our bases are located. Thank you very much. We don't want to lose these military bases. And so as the military leaders look at bases that need to be closed, one of the questions they're going to be asking is, does the base have its own power? There's a variety of ways, both natural events and ones that are intentional by somebody who wants to do us harm, who can attack that substation down the street or cyber attack. Our goal in the Department of Defense is to be more prepared for the full range, not just in natural disasters, but if somebody really intends to mean us harm, it's something we must protect above anything else, ensuring that every American has power every time and all the time when they turn on the lights. We now know that Russia has cyber tools embedded in the U.S. electrical grid and in other areas in, to include in our nuclear power plants, which shows an ability to scale this potentially to a pretty high level. What we're doing today is we're demonstrating uh, this trailer that we've developed. It's for a mobile microgrid training platform. So that way, instead of having to worry about buying all these components yourself or having to know how to set it up, we've developed the training manuals, the hardware, and put it all together. The nice thing about this is uh, the concept is grid stability. Um, if you're looking at having a, a power generation station miles and miles away and you have a blackout, there could be thousands of things that go wrong in between point A and point B. Now, if you throw something like this on a much larger scale in between point A and point B, you have something to kind of act as a backup, as a stabilizer to the grid. And if we're going to be putting these out there, then they need to know how it's going to interface with their equipment. And there's nothing that's going to stop someone from trying to put one of these on their own property. Renewables can give people the chance of not being tethered to a government-created monopoly. They can have individual liberty to generate their own electricity. Those states that have really intransigent utilities that are saying we don't want to do renewables that are pushing back on the right to go solar, those states are going to lose out. Amazon's not going to that state. So go to your elected officials and say, we want those companies here and we know that they want clean energy. So what are we doing to provide for it? There's an energy revolution going on, including with electric cars. What I would say to the utility monopolies is you need to be supporting the electric car industry 
because the bottom line is they're burning your electricity and your electrons that you make a profit off of. As soon as electricity became central to the health of economies and to the vitality of cities, we decided, you know what? Providing this technology is too important to leave it in the hands of unregulated for-profit companies. And that's why we have public utility commissions that regulate for-profit utility companies to make sure that they're serving the greater public interest while they're making a profit. I'm going to read from Psalm 133. Mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. In Christ we pray, amen. amen. The Public Utilities Commission has a huge impact on clean air, on clean water, but most importantly on the amount of money people have to pay the utilities. We've been living with this for years and years and years. And we want a change. Monday, the town hall of Germfask was filled with nearly 100 people to discuss electric costs. What the public is tired of is monthly electric bills costing as much as $1,000. I got a young couple behind me had back to back $600 plus electric bills. We've got people who actually have a higher utility bill than they do a mortgage on their house. If your public utility commission doesn't have a strategy for building the utility of the future, then demand that they do it. This is a very powerful group of people that sets policies around our livelihood. The 2019 Renewable Energy Development Initiative. All in favor of staff's recommendation, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. So if you want to have a, a balanced public service commission, first of all, know the issues, study the issues, study who's there, Study who's retiring and put somebody in there that will address your issue. You want me to untie the front? Yes, please. Start the I don't have to go to the governor and ask the governor if I can do such and such. I don't have to go to the legislature and ask them if I can introduce a docket to do this and this because I'm not appointed by the governor. I'm not elected by the legislature. I have to answer to 10 million people in this state who I have to answer to. Because they don't buy three million vote, but. <laughs> I think when it comes to power companies, I understand the position where they are. Their job, like everything else in our system, uh, is to return a dollar for their investors. Now, when the companies can begin to say, how do we make a profit as well as protect the environment, then I think we're on the right path. I want the power company at the table when it comes to developing solar and EVs because they have the money, they have the infrastructure. It's their job to help develop this infrastructure. And if we're asking them to do that, then they're going to have to be compensated for that. We have to give our utilities the opportunity to make money in a way that satisfies what their customers really want and begin to shift them away from that addiction to rate basing and building big power plants. And it is an addiction. They're addicted to it because Wall Street encourages it. They make a lot of money off of it. And when that's how they meet their quarterly earnings targets, that's what they're going to do. Georgia is an interesting case history. In Georgia, the Army has three major military bases. We were looking for locations to put renewable energy. At the same time, Georgia Power was decommissioning 15 of their coal-fired power plants. And so they were looking for their next generation power source. So once the utilities understood that there was an opportunity for them, they really stepped up. Pentagon said, Commissioner, we want to make Georgia the model state for the Army in renewable energy. They wanted 30 megawatts of solar power at Fort Benning, 30 megawatts at Fort Gordon, 30 megawatts at Fort Stewart. 
Then what happened? The Navy comes forth and said, we want 30 megawatts of solar power for the submarine base. Then the Marines at the Logistics Center in Albany, Georgia, said they want 31 megawatts of solar power there. Now we are today working with Robbins Air Force Base on 139 megawatts. One essential ingredient for our success there was the strength of the partnership. In the event of a grid outage, Georgia Power would sell that power directly to us. So they installed smart inverters so that when the power goes down in the rest of Georgia, that power will be channeled into our installation. These military projects are owned by Georgia Power is done in a way that benefits all customers. The energy from those facilities flows back to the grid so that all Georgia Power customers get to benefit from that long-term price certainty and, and the, the other benefits that come along with solar. The other thing is the Army had the land, so they didn't have to do eminent domain and disrupt the local community. We have land that's buffered between Army activities and the community. Why not put it to productive use? We have what's called in the utility business, the avoided cost. In other words, this is what it costs you to produce that kilowatt of electricity. And in Georgia, in our solar production thus far, with no state subsidies and no upward pressure on our rate payers, are coming in below avoided cost of what we're paying for power today. There's more solar on Department of Defense installations in Georgia than any other state, including California. Let me make it clear to my fellow Republicans, we did not subsidize this. And the way that we've done this has caused rates to decrease. Decrease. That is what Republicans want to hear. The future of the grid will be one in which we see fewer and fewer large power plants and more and more houses that are providing their own energy that also have electric vehicles plugged into the garage. Well, that takes the utility completely out of the loop. So either you transform and adapt or get out of the way. If a utility partners with automotive, then all of a sudden you have mobile energy storage, and if you have vehicle-to-grid communications, now the utility has a new market. Electric vehicles are, frankly, one of the only areas of load growth right now for utilities across this country. In other words, that's one of the only ways that their system is actually experiencing increased usage. No question about it, the electric industry is changing and Georgia Power is no different. We're experiencing a lot of the same trends that are happening nationwide. Our loads are not growing as much as they used to. Our revenues are flatter and we're modernizing our business to try to reduce costs, become as efficient as we can. We also have a focus on off-road electric transportation, which includes electric cranes at the Ports Authority. We've got the tugs that move luggage down at the airport, along with forklifts. And so we've got a heavy emphasis across the board of electrifying the transportation infrastructure. We actually will partner with equipment manufacturers and loan out vehicles or different end uses that are electric and let them test those and really get a feel for them over a matter of weeks to figure out how they can transform their business. We need to be able to come up with policies that will increase the number of people that use the vehicles and that give the proper incentives you know, to the power company to want to spend their own money building the infrastructure. And these folks need to strategize together if they want to have dominance in the electric vehicle market.
There is a narrative in the United States that says, ah, but nobody like us can innovate. And there may have been periods in time in the last 50 years or so where that was at least partially true. It isn't true anymore. The Chinese will fill the gap. They see the future very clearly, and they're seriously looking at being the world's leaders in these areas. Arguably, they already are in wind and solar, so we have to compete, or we will get overrun, and we're running short on time. It has been difficult to get people to make this shift. People, especially here in the South, they do love their car. They love their F-150. And so while we're focusing on getting individuals to consider electric vehicles, and there's more and more of them offered each year, we are focusing on the big game changers like trucks, over-the-road trucks, delivery trucks, school buses, transit buses. These are vehicles that run many hours a day that are the biggest polluters. We're working on a total of about 12 different electric vehicle types that are designed to go to fleet customers. Fleet customers today want EVs for one simple reason. They have substantially lower operating costs. We're at an inflection point with the electric vehicles. The electric utilities clearly have to be part of that transformation and their key role is to put in the electric charging infrastructure and to make sure that they have capacity on hand to handle that. How is my favorite commissioner <laughs> doing? Fine. Have you ever been here before? I have not. You're going to be impressed. Good to see you, sir. Welcome back to Green for You. Looks like the plan's coming together, isn't it? It's all coming together. We have our first product in the marketplace. Last year, there were 29 million vehicles made in China. But importantly, 40% of those vehicles were made by companies that didn't exist 20 years ago. And the carbon fiber process, too. Is carbon fiber, that's another way of lightweighting. All of the vehicles, starting with our light-duty SUV, up to these heavy-duty SUVs, basically use the same chassis. I don't have to worry about oil changes, no spark plugs, no timing belts to break, no transmission to go out. All of those things that break on regular gasoline cars are not in this car. It's not just the fact that you're getting rid of having to buy fuel, you also don't have to do any maintenance to it. And you cannot beat an electric car off the line. You, we have 100% torque from zero. Now, for the first time in history, renewable energy is the cheap option. And as soon as solar plus storage and wind plus storage is the same cost or cheaper than every other source like gas and coal and nuclear, then why would we choose anything else? There's two ways that you can think about batteries if you're a utility. They could terrify you, or you could see them as an opportunity to own them, to facilitate them, to earn money off of them. There's nothing really stopping a utility from being the one to provide that battery storage to its customers. There's nothing stopping a utility from making the proposal to its Public Utilities Commission to say, hey, we'd like to make money off of providing battery storage to all of our customers. And of course, battery storage is the very best kind of responsive, flexible resource that utilities like. If a utility suddenly has a spike in demand and they need to ramp up production, if they're trying to ramp up from a coal-fired power plant, it's going to take a couple hours. If they're trying to ramp up from a natural gas-fired power plant, it's going to take a couple of minutes. If they're trying to ramp up from a battery storage, it's gonna take a couple milliseconds. 
It's instantaneous. It's such a superior technology. We're going to turn the corner so fast it'll make people's heads spin. If the utility industry and the automotive industry don't work well together, what you're going to see is the emergence of third parties. You're already seeing Google enter the automotive industry. And could Google enter the utility industry as well? I mean, where there is a void, someone's going to step in to fill the void. The investor-owned utilities of this nation, they've got to protect their investors. They've got to have the visionaries on their boards, on their staff, to understand what impact the electric vehicle is going to have, what impact solar energy is going to have, wind energy is going to have, what impact is continuation of, of fracking going to have. Are we going to be able to continue fracking all the time, or some of these lawsuits going to dispel fracking? The question is, if you're an oil man, for example, what is your future? Fossil fuels have to come out of the energy mix. How are you going to respond? Do we continue to merge around a smaller and smaller industry and eventually the last person in the room turns out the light? Or do we transform ourselves into something else? Do we transform ourselves into renewable energy companies? Do we transform ourselves into carbon management companies? If carbon dioxide has to come out of the atmosphere, oil companies could be good candidates for the ones that need to do it. The oil industry is really largely unregulated, so Unlike the electric industry, which can be transitioned from a regulatory standpoint and I think could have a soft landing, the oil industry is, I think, a lot more vulnerable to that sort of crash landing. And so it's going to be up to the shareholders of these oil companies to say, what are we going to do to pivot? There's kind of an obvious solution for gas stations is turn them all into charging stations. They already got covers, so make all of that solar. They're all connected to the grid already. Change is hard, and large complex systems are particularly hard, but all the pieces are in place. It's available, we know how to do it. We just have to figure out how to manage that change at an institutional level without putting lots of businesses at risk of having stranded assets, because those businesses will suffer, the investors in those businesses will suffer, and the workers in those industries will suffer. I have been in the solar consulting industry since 2008. We do installations now in a day to two days tops. My sales are all from referrals. I do not knock on doors. I don't do any of those things, all referrals. I've lived in Pebble Creek since 2001. moved from Tennessee to uh, Arizona. For the most part, it's a very conservative community. So when I began advocating solar electric, uh, I was concerned that it might be a partisan issue. It is not a political issue. It is apolitical. Hey, Charlie. How are you? I am terrific. We're into your head. <laughs> you really are. <laughs> and I yeah. got to tell you. So this... what is 
the number whole down area there. has a ton of uh, 1,406. So we're officially at 1,406 solar energy systems yes. on rooftops in on Pebble Creek. On rooftops in yeah. Pebble Creek. Which is, what, 30%? 30%. Of the entire community. Yes. yes. Ooh, come on in. Good to see you. I'm Cher. My husband and I. Good morning. Welcome. We are here. here. Oh. When I was on the commission, we established the policies like net metering and the renewable energy standard that really led to the boom of solar in Arizona. Believe it or not, it was an all Republican commission at the time. And we actually believed that, that people would go solar. You know, I'm curious as a former commissioner, why you initially decided to do it. If I can save $2,2200 a year, yeah. why would I not do that? Particularly on fixed incomes. My first Arizona summer electric bill I'd never seen a $400 monthly electric bill, and I was scandalized by that amount. <laughs> it's free. It's, it's sun. It's a win-win-win. You know, win. There are no downsides. Let's, let's look in using that. If we can scatter the creation of electricity throughout a neighborhood, we don't have to build a giant plant right out here in the desert that burns coal and fouls the air of the Grand Canyon and requires transmission lines to get the power back into town. I think of the utility companies as the bully. For all of us around here, we want solar for the right reasons. It's the right thing to do for us, for the environment, for our neighbors, for the country. And then you're fighting the people that are doing it for greed. And it ticks me off. If we don't get our act together and start utilizing the technologies that are available to us now, we are going to be, the United States is going to be left in the dust. Technologies we invented. Yes, that we invented. Yes. We're going to be left in the dust. There's virtually no one that is opposed to solar. Now that differs from our elected officials who think that they need to be anti-solar, but they're going against their constituents when they say that. Can you give us an update about the tax credit or any bills that impact electric vehicles? All new build residential has to be EV ready. Just making the business case, we're going to literally drive traffic to your establishments uh, to rent in your units if you can provide EV spaces. The market is demanding this. And that's why the commissioners need to understand electric vehicles. They need to be driving electric vehicles. I've been criticized a little bit by my own party for wanting to subsidize electric vehicles or to give solar more value. There are benefits to a tax credit, for example, for electric cars. Uh, Georgia was second only to California before we removed our tax credit. So when the legislature eliminated it, electric car sales began to skid in our state, dropped 95%, as a matter of fact. Solar is not something that only tree huggers like. What is more conservative than generating your own electricity and not being dependent on someone else to do it for you? Just because they're conservative doesn't mean they can't embrace electric cars. Or like not having to be beholden to whatever the utility decides they want to charge them. There was a while where when I first came out to North Carolina and I was racing and I wanted to fit in. And at some point I just realized I'm so different from so many people in the garage that I sort of gave up on fitting in. I will have hit 70,000 miles by the time I get home on the Tesla. I mean, think of how much money I've saved in gas over 70,000 miles. Without the race car, the demographic of people that I would be able to reach would be so much smaller if I was just still a biology scientist. I can't expect NASCAR fans to show up at a clean energy conference in Aspen. You know, it's not going to happen. They're not going to come to the environmental film festival. It's sort of like I'm on these two sides and I'm balancing these two worlds and I don't fit in completely on either side, but I get to see both of those audiences talking to me as one of them. And there is so much more that we share 
than what divides us. Put it on a moral foundation. Everyone has a right to clean water, to toxic free air. When we talk about many of the environmental injustice issues, this is a civil rights issue of our time. To take care and protect my creation. We will stand as one united force. And we as human beings who've been charged with being stewards of a planet that has been given to us that was perfectly balanced in terms of water, in terms of air, and we have been destructive and we have neglected our moral responsibility in doing what's so necessary so that not the next generation, this generation can have a more sustainable way of life. So therefore we have an obligation to fight. We will not bend, we will not break, and we will not bow down.